Welcome to the Tetrakey Business Revolutionary Podcast. My name is Rob Yates, Tetrakey CEO, co founder, and serial entrepreneur. In these podcasts, we're going to be bringing to you true business revolutionaries. That people who've done it differently, done it their way, had success, achieved more than the rest, and are willing to share with you exactly how they went about doing it. As well as that, Mark Hopkins, my co-founder, and I will be bringing you podcasts where we give you information about what it is we're doing to grow a business from one country across five continents in just four years. In this episode, we're going to start to unpack the future with global experts on future technologies, business, artificial intelligence, and faculty member of the Singularity University, David Auburn. David is far more than a future speculator. He has an exceptionally successful global business background where he walks his own talk. He was an early stage investor in cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin and Ethereum, and is now the founder of Network Society Ventures, a seed stage investment firm focused on innovative startups that are using exponential technologies and decentralized networks. All I can say is, wow, I cannot wait for this. This is critical for all of us if we want to stay relevant and be profitable going forwards into our future. This podcast is brought to you by the Tetricky Business Revolutionary Club. Our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month loads of free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, or follow revolutionaryclub.tetrakey.com. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Revolutionary podcast and a huge welcome to our guest today, David Auburn. I briefly met David a few weeks ago when he gave a keynote presentation at an event that I got invited to by a mutual friend of ours, Scott Pickin, who is the CEO of Wealth Migrate. And, and I sat there mesmerized by David because in probably 30 or 45 minutes, he joined together lots of dots that I had in my head about where my business was going to, where clients' businesses were going to, where opportunities could be. Um, and I sat there and it's not often that I'm speechless, but I was slightly speechless. Um, the thing that I did leave with was a massive list of questions and, and a desire to spend more time with David. So I, I decided to reach out and graciously he's with us today. So, so David, here we are. And thank you for joining us today and, um, and giving us your valuable time. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And so you've become very well known globally as an authority on future-based technologies, future-based business. Um, and I'm really curious, what brought you to this place? Where did your journey start? Uh, how did you arrive? 30 years ago, when I started my professional career, uh, the first uh, steps were in artificial intelligence. I originally studied uh, as a physicist. Uh, but I was not uh, smart enough to be a theoretical uh, physicist, and uh, I really uh, didn't want to be a cog in a machine that uh, so much of experimental physics is today. At the time, we were a few thousand. Today, literally tens of thousands of physicists work on wonderful machines like the Large Hadron Collider, for example. All beautiful endeavors. Uh, but I felt uh, I wanted to uh, draw my own path 
uh, in finding ways to add value to, to my life, uh, personally, professionally, and, and, and to my community. Um, so from artificial intelligence, I, I went into things like uh, Internet of Things, uh, online video. Uh, I was part of the group uh, that 10 years ago designed Singularity University at the NASA Research Park. Um, with funding from Google and others. At Singularity University, we uh, study exponential technologies and how these impact uh, society and the way we do business. And the uh, most well-known exponential technology that all of uh, uh, your audience is familiar with is uh, information technology, how computers get better and better uh, every um, year or two not just incrementally, but literally doubling their performance. Um, and um, with that uh, kind of uh, deep understanding of, of the nature of exponential change, uh, I decided that decentralization was a logical consequence. And my current uh, endeavors uh, as an investor uh, and uh, as uh, the creator of uh, initiatives uh, around these themes um, uh, these are all centered around the intersection of exponentials and decentralization. It strikes me that most people in the world, well, they've heard the words artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, blockchain. In fact, I was speaking with my mother-in-law yesterday, and she said, well, I've heard it, yet what is all this stuff? For me, what I'd like to unpick from your head are exactly that. What are these things? Even today, there's still confusion about social media, even though it's been with us for over a decade. People are simply not aware of the developments that are taking place in the world today. For many people, they get heavily influenced by Hollywood that breeds a motion of fear. Movies like iRobot with Will Smith and robots taking over the world. And that's um, a lot of people's model. So what is the reality of this future integration? In... AI started uh, really a long time ago, uh, even before technology was so prevalent in everybody's life. We were already asking ourselves, what is the nature of human intelligence? What is the nature of our own consciousness, self-awareness, curiosity, uh, creativity, uh, you know, mythological uh, stories like uh, the, 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 the golem uh, and, uh, and Frankenstein and the uh, so much uh, of, of our uh, introspection is centered uh, around these questions. So when computers started to promise the possibility of not only dreaming and theorizing and, and writing beautiful stories around uh, that, but uh, testing whether there could really be something there, um, well, a lot of people jumped on the opportunity and Already 50 or 70 years ago, they started to uh, analyze how uh, computers could be smart. Uh, initially, these were uh, overambitious attempts. Uh, people believed that uh, uh, some astonishing result could really be just around the corner. And uh, uh, little by little, we were able to map out the, uh, the limitations and the boundaries of uh, the tools that we had available. Uh, and realized that much more powerful tools were needed. And, and still today, uh, not everybody uh, in the field is in agreement of uh, what is the threshold above which certain goals will be achievable uh, as they are defined and set by the uh, artificial intelligence uh, community and uh, those who want to employ these uh, uh, results in, in, in their businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, especially important is the distinction between uh, um, uh, special or specialized artificial intelligence and, and general artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, AGI, is what Hollywood uh, loves to represent mostly. So that's the humanization of artificial intelligence almost. 
Well, uh, anthropomorphizing uh, the uh, goals and the um, and the tools with which an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, will go about its life, uh, is a way for Hollywood to tell stories that we can comprehend. Uh, one of uh, a likely outcome. If, if these uh, things will, will uh, share the planet and the universe with us, is that a lot of the things that they will aim to do and then achieve to do with resources that they gather are going to be uh, pretty much incomprehensible to us. So, so looking at just the things that they can do with respect to what we can understand, uh, it is very much likely that uh, in their priority list, uh, the highest places are not going to be occupied by taking machine guns and, 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 and killing people. They will have much better things to do with their time and their resources. But what is really exhilarating for those that, uh, that are looking at the field today is that there are things that were incredibly ambitious that we could only dream about even 10 years ago, and today they are happening. Uh, whether it is day-to-day um, -day use of uh, uh, speech recognition, where you can dictate something to the computer and it will write it at a very high precision, or you can have a dialogue with uh, your digital assistant and it will tell you whether the bad weather or set an alarm in your clock or whatever you do uh, with your smart um, uh, devices. Uh, or uh, uh, another category entirely, uh, the capacity of uh, computers to uh, identify the uh, content of, a, of an image. Uh, it used to be the case that it was a joke that the computer would not be able to, um, you know, separate a dog from a cat. And today, uh, if you uh, use cloud-based services for storing your photos, Many of them will not only recognize faces, allowing you to label some and then infer uh, that the same person is represented on other photos that you did not label, but even uh, more um, autonomously um, start providing you photos that you can search for based on labels that you did not supply at all. Uh, whether they are animals and horses or monuments or places or uh, things like sport or soccer or, or cricket or baseball. Uh, or my favorite query, uh, people smiling on the beach at sunset. That I know in my archive of almost 200,000 photos uh, in the cloud will bring back uh, two photos of my children who are playing uh, on the seaside and uh, it is an incredible demonstration of the current power of artificial intelligence to serve our needs in a manner that has zero barriers. That is very important. You know, your listeners will spend uh, a considerable, considerable amount of uh, time uh, of their life listening to us trying to understand uh, what AI is or whatever other topics we will cover. Well, what is amazing today is that, yes, maybe they will have fun doing that or they are driving to, to go to work or coming home. And so that is the way they uh, occupy the time. But really, uh, getting your hands dirty and finding out concretely what AI can do for you today is possible with just five minutes uh, or less. You, you can, you can uh, witness what I'm talking about very, very easily. And it is the same for many technologies. Because we already say, hey, Siri. Well, absolutely. Uh, the, the digital assistants and, and their uh, capabilities uh, are all around us. And uh, many people are absolutely comfortable with uh, having a dialogue with a computer. And it is going to be more and more the case in the future. It's interesting. I, I sat on a plane um, a few, or oh, end of last year, next to an Indian gentleman um, who heads up one of the teams in AI at Amazon. Um, and he, was, he, he got telling me about his latest project, which is around how to make um, AI produce variable outcomes. 
that would be consistent with a variant of a human being. And uh, jeepers, he went on about it for hours and hours and hours because we can, we don't, I, di I didn't realize that already we can produce machines that can produce exceptionally consistent, reliable business results for us. You know, two plus two will always make four, but, but getting the variability in there is, it, it is quite complicated. Anyway, that's a complete aside. Um, it was a, a fascinating eight, 14 hours between San Francisco and Dubai. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, a lot of uh, what we are trying to teach machines is how to cope uh, with uh, the complexity uh, of a world that they are getting ready to enter. Um, in the 60s, computers were so delicate and so fragile that we needed to shield them. Only a priesthood of white-coated uh, uh, lab technicians were allowed to enter the air-conditioned rooms where uh, these uh, electronic brains were uh, kept. Uh, and uh, the way they learned about the world was through punch cards or, or other arcane interfaces. Every day you turn them off, uh, the morning after, they restarted opening their eyes on the universe and, and you had to teach them everything from scratch. Uh, today, uh, computers are uh, robust enough and they have uh, created a, a subtle and rich enough understanding of the world that they don't need that kind of uh, pampering. Uh, and, uh, and more and more, they can face uh, uh, the world without our uh, intermediation. Uh, that is why um, the Internet of Things, for example, uh, is uh, um, emerging now because a lot of the nodes in this network of networks of sensors and actuators is based on autonomous decision making by machines where humans uh, define what is the desired outcome, but they don't and cannot um, uh, confirm uh, or second guess uh, every decision among the billions and tens of billions that are made by machines every day. Wow, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And as, as we move on, the other word that gets bounced around a lot at this point in time, which isn't directly linked to AI, well, I suppose it is in some respects, is, is the word blockchain. Um, <clears throat> now, I have to be honest that I only found out what the word blockchain really meant uh, 18 months ago when I started dabbling in cryptocurrency um, and started playing. Um, and I'm pretty sure that most people don't know what blockchain what the word blockchain means or is is there a short definition you could give us before we just move on and explore that slightly further first of all nobody has to feel guilty when they find out about some technology uh, uh, and, and and they feel they are late you are not late um, we are seven billion people on the planet maybe almost eight uh, and i can tell you you are at the uh, forefront of experimentation in the avant-garde of exploring uh, uh, the understanding and the implications of uh, AI and blockchain and many other things, and so are your listeners. Um, it is uh, uh, a very feature of our world today that things rapidly change and we have to make an effort to keep up. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, if you waited 10 years uh, and, and then you found out about uh, the latest uh, improvement in whatever farming technology, you will still a dangerous uh, rebel uh, and, and a revolutionary uh, because uh, things uh, took generations to spread around the world and to be adopted. Uh, today, with uh, an open global uh, communication network uh, encompassing every continent, uh, the best ideas travel extremely fast. Uh, uh, they cross uh, fertilize each other. Uh, they are tested out rapidly with startups that uh, blossom or fail frequently, uh, weeding out those uh, uh, technologies and approaches that don't work. Uh, but the ones that do uh, leverage uh, the existing network to take root everywhere very, very rapidly. So back to your question. The blockchain uh, is the current uh, culmination of a decade-long research uh, uh, that uh, 
mathematical question. Is it possible to distribute um, something that everybody can agree is true without uh, having a central uh, authority that everybody needed to trust? How could we organize this distribution of information? And the blockchain achieved that um, by putting together extremely uh, smart approaches uh, that uh, created um, a process uh, through which uh, this, this is possible, to arrive to a consensus around truth without having to rely on a central authority that everybody must necessarily trust. And, uh, and uh, the consequences of, of this uh, uh, mathematical invention are, are pretty profound, and we are um, finding them. We are uh, experimenting with what they, they can be, and there are a lot of people who believe that the implications will be as profound and even more than those uh, changes that uh, were brought about um, in, uh, by, by the Internet. Wow. So if, if I understand it correctly, it's um, the, the blockchain is almost like a, a virtual ledger up in the sky, a, a track record that we can all access uh, of, of interactions around something um, that can be added to but not deleted. Is, is that, would that be a way of thinking about it? Or? So the implementation that uh, has been found to this goal uh, has a certain number of consequences. Uh, yes, one of the consequences is that once you establish that something is true, somebody else cannot dabble with that and say, you know what, I don't agree. Uh, because uh, as soon as that consensus has been achieved, uh, that fact is recorded, and it is recorded in a manner that it cannot be altered. Um, the ledger that you mentioned, a, a database, uh, is um, maybe better to, to, to think about it not being in the sky, where you think of it as a single uh, location, but uh, it is in many, many copies all over the network. And the network is busy replicating this database so that it cannot be corrupted, it cannot be uh, lost, it cannot be uh, dabbled with without other people realizing that somebody uh, is looking at a copy that has been altered. In, in this kind of constant distribution and replication and verification is what uh, the blockchain network is busy about, providing immense value in the process. And so it's, it's working hard. And in fact, Scott um, shared an article with me the other day about, um, uh, to get, this, get the words right, but the, the industries that are going to be most disrupted by blockchain technologies um, the, and it pretty much went through a list of identifying who the, the middlemen are. So the, the insurance broker between the insurance firm and the end user, the real estate agent in between two parties, the, the I don't know, the lawyer, the banker, just to, to name a few. And I'm well aware that a lot of our listeners actually fulfill a role as a, as a middleman. Um, what, what do they need to start thinking about doing or doing differently? Um, simply to stay employed, stay relevant, stay profitable going forwards? Sure. My favorite example is when you receive a, a, an email with a PDF attachment, and maybe a few years ago it would have been a, a fax, uh, that is, uh, let's assume, a purchase order. And as you open the attachment, you realize that that purchase order is actually the printout of a computer system. And then you take it and you enter it into your own computer system. So... If you look at that process, it is very, very disheartening because some human being, a very valuable and precious human being that probably has been loved and nurtured by his or her mother and then schooled and educated and then found employment and then uh, created a family, uh, spent, wasted minutes, maybe hours, and if that is his or her job, days and weeks and months and years of his life, doing something completely pointless, re-entering data, 
that computers already knew how to manage into another computer being in the process the slowest and least reliable component of the entire chain. Uh, and it's horrible. So each of our, your listeners who are doing something like that or who have employees who do something like that must realize that as our computer systems become smarter and smarter, interconnecting processes and automating processes, if they happen to eliminate a job or a task that is of the nature that I just described, that is something to cherish, to celebrate. It is not something to fear and to oppose because those jobs are inhumane to start with. We should not uh, waste uh, human creativity and passion and, 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 and uh, creativity uh, around uh, these kinds of, of, of uh, tasks that are much better suited to, to machines. Now, what that means is that we are actually freeing up resources. We are enabling people who are smart, well-educated, uh, who, who know how to use a computer, how to su subscribe to a podcast, how to well invest their time in order to further their understanding of the world, to think about their clients' needs and how they can add value, how they can analyze their clients' needs going beyond the current uh, product or service offerings and come up with something that currently no computer is able to dreaming uh, of, of creating because humans are needed to create those new products and services that other humans will want. And, and that is what is the, uh, the, the bridge that we can build between the uncertainty today, where a lot of people are um, uh, living in, in, in fear of, of their economic stability, and uh, the promise of tomorrow, where we should all be able and, and dedicate ourselves to occupations that uh, maximize uh, our human qualities. And I mean, the curious thing for me is, is What's the likely time frame in terms of the, something like blockchain in real estate or in insurance sales or something like that, of that, act, that technology actually becoming um, really, really obvious and this change coming about? I mean, is, is, it, is it weeks, months, years, decades? Well, uh, it is a question obvious to whom. Uh, you know, there are still people, I can tell you, who are crossing their fingers and wish they would wake up every day uh, so that the nightmare of this internet and e-commerce fad uh, to have passed. Uh, they are still living in, in, in the conviction that they are uh, in just in a bad dream and the good old days when, uh, you know, the milkman would deposit the bottle every morning and uh, uh, the housewives would uh, take care of uh, dinner and uh, everybody was happy. Uh, would come back. Uh, they have no idea, probably, because they are honest people, that that world never existed. Um, but uh, uh, they are not going to wake up. Uh, the internet is real. E-commerce has changed uh, uh, the face of retail and wholesale and supply chains. Uh, and uh, the disruption that uh, it is creating is still ongoing. Blockchain is going to need 20 plus years. Uh, blockchain is uh, going to impact businesses across those industries that you mentioned and others for 20, 30 years. There will be businesses that die sooner if they don't adapt, like Blockbuster died because they didn't believe uh, DVDs and DVD rental and then streaming would amount to anything. Um, uh, Kodak died because they didn't believe in uh, digital photography being real. Uh, there will be businesses that uh, uh, not believing that the blockchain is real will be unable to, to adapt to any degree and they will f die fast. There will be others that, uh, that will have a longer uh, staying power. But uh, the best businesses will be those that embrace the change 
and they find ways to add value to their uh, network of participants uh, in uh, resource allocation uh, in, in, in very new ways uh, that uh, really will require new business models. So in, um, in, in, so in practical terms, there's, uh, for, for Joe, the average business owner, it, it sounds like the, the, the message is to find ways to automate and use machines to do things that machines can do better than human beings and then set the human beings free to continually add better value, higher quality of service or product to the, to the customer um, and, and not interfere in the, tech, in, in the place where tech does better? Well, uh, I, I would uh, uh, confirm that, but even move uh, one step further. Uh, the uh, interference should not only stop uh, between uh, humans and machines with humans letting machines free uh, through automation because they do things best that can be automated. But humans should not interfere with humans either uh, in businesses where creativity uh, and customer-facing passion are cherished. Um, middle management should not look at uh, other people as employees who have be told what they need to do day in, day out, those people should be given a degree of autonomy as well. And, and uh, that is, I think, uh, extremely uh, empowering, emancipating, and will uh, be a big challenge for uh, tightly controlled, hierarchical and centralized businesses that look at people as a resource, as cogs in the machine. Uh, those businesses that uh, uh, understand uh, the power of uh, 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 inclusion and, and uh, a continuous uh, discovery of new skills and, and, and openly having conversations with suppliers, with customers, and finding solutions that serve them best by people who are at any point of what we would call hierarchy previously, those businesses are going to be able to thrive much uh, uh, more sustainably and, and in a resilient manner within the changes that we are going to see around us. Mm. It's interview interesting how very many people are coming at this from uh, to the same point where you are now. I interviewed David Marquet, who uh, wrote the book Turn the Ship Around. I don't know if you've read it or not, um, about intent-based leadership. And coming from a non-technology-based uh, thought process, from a human-to-human -human interaction and how to get the most out of people. Um, he's the guy who stopped giving orders on the nuclear submarines and started saying, well, tell me what you intend on doing and why you intend on doing it, because you know what the mission is and you know what your job is, so go, go do it. Uh, Absolutely. And, 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 you know... Um... It used to be that uh, a given interpretation of uh, Aristoteles and other uh, uh, Greeks uh, during the Middle Ages uh, perpetuated uh, an aristocratic view where humanistic um, endeavors would be on one side and then uh, technology and applications would be on the other side and the two shall never meet. But uh, this kind of uh, division is, is, is not only... Uh, artificial and unnecess unnecessary, but uh, actually harmful. Uh, uh, technology and, and humanities coexist, compenetrate, reinforce each other, hybridize, cross-fertilize. And, and uh, those organizations and people who understand that uh, they can be great leaders with technology or that technology can make them more human in their uh, relationships uh, and emotional intelligence. Those are, are uh, in my opinion, um, able to better cope with the future that is coming fast. Future technology is, is presenting a, a deep cultural challenge for businesses, for countries, for governments. Um, and... And on one side, I feel like as human beings, we're being given this massive opportunity to take a, uh, an amount of ownership for our world, our whole world, that maybe we haven't experienced for hundreds of years. Um, 
for instance, I was just thinking, you know, the the private key for my e-wallet, uh, for my cryptocurrency. You know, it only takes one one number wrong in that, and suddenly my money, my if I transfer uh, currency around it, it, it can evaporate. So taking there is lesser in the way of safeguard, I suppose, um, and yet there's there's also more ownership, less people telling me what I have to do or have not to do. Um, on the flip side of the coin, I kind of see a whole load of people who aren't necessarily ready to take that increased level of responsibility for themselves, for their own futures. It's, it's a big melting pot. Um, is there likely to be a divide in society or, or how do you think this will play out? Um, definitely um, different cultures, societies, but also different individuals um, exhibit a propensity to uh, experiment and to adopt uh, uh, novel solutions to different degrees. Uh, and uh, um, it is not necessarily that uh, one is right and the other is wrong. It is a question of finding the right balance of risk taking and uh, uh, understanding what uh, the um, potential modes of failure can be uh, and, and then act uh, responsibly uh, as a consequence uh, and understand and, and analyze the, the consequences. So uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, we have certain um, technologies available to us uh, definitely makes us extremely powerful and, and we have to be responsible uh, in using that, uh, that power, uh, being aware of it, being aware of its consequences. Uh, in the past, it wasn't that uh, we were not uh, powerful and that we were not uh, uh, recognizing uh, that, that power. The difference is that of scale. Uh, if uh, I hit the wrong uh, uh, button, on uh, uh, my MailChimp uh, account as I send out my newsletter, uh, something very stupid will go to hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, uh, and, you know, that is not um, a big deal. You know, I will send them a, an apology uh, a little later. Uh, but if I press the wrong button on my nuclear power plant, uh, I will poison an ocean for hundreds or thousands of years, right? Uh, so uh, human civilization today uh, is uh, such that uh, uh, the planet uh, that we uh, felt was uh, unbounded uh, and that uh, we could uh, do whatever we wanted. It didn't matter uh, because nature was so immensely more powerful than we were that, that uh, you know, uh, it, we could kill uh, thousands and tens of thousands of bison and there would still be bison on the plains every year uh, roaming and, and we could just keep and kill them and kill them and nothing happened. Well, that wasn't true. That wasn't true then and, and, and today uh, we must call out those who pretend to shy away from, from the reality of our power because we have the responsibility of, of managing it that uh, uh, with our eyes wide open. The, the, the bison, the planes stopped coming because we killed them all. And the power that we have over the planet today is such that we cannot um, afford uh, to elect or appoint uh, uh, leaders, uh, whether technological or political, uh, that make decisions not taking that power into account responsibly. Mm. And that goes from everything from technology, global warming, care of the planet and human beings, everything, doesn't it? Wow. Um, so I hope you don't mind, but I asked some of our listeners and um, some of our clients what questions they would like me to ask you. So I've, I've got some questions here. And the first one is um, from one of our one of our associates in Portland, in Oregon, in the USA. And he asks, uh, what advice could you give him as a parent about how to enable his three-year-old son to grow up into this future world and have a purposeful, successful, productive uh, life? 10 or 20 or 30,000 years ago, if I left the cave in the morning and uh, uh, you know my family wanted me to come back with a prey 
and they built a nice fire and I didn't come back. They waited a day or two, but not much, much more. They knew I was dead. Uh, even a hundred or 200 years ago, if I was as courageous as attempting to open a, uh, I don't know, um, a pub, uh, and, uh, and I borrowed some money and the pub didn't go well, uh, I would end up in the debtor's prison and uh, all my family would be immediately reduced to extreme poverty and I would not reemerge from debtor's prison. That was practically a death sentence. And that is how nature first and society then uh, measured risk-taking. It was really, really, really risky uh, to go beyond uh, the accepted boundaries of, of, of behavior uh, even in something as simple as as trying to uh, you know uh, improve your your life or 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 experiment with something today we all of us regardless of the age can afford are actually encouraged to take risks in order to find out what works so what is very important is that too many of our current institutions, whether the schools or the workplace, are um, uh, promoting uh, 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 an, a balance that is wrong in terms of how much uh, effort should be put on, on, on creativity and how much uh, effort should be put on, on repeatable well-understood processes. Um, so that is the reason schools so often kill creativity and passion in children. That is why uh, adults are told that they should uh, lower their heads and accept a stultifying job uh, that they hate and, and they cannot wait uh, every day and week and month and year for it to end and then they go and, and retire and then they die. That is not how lives should be lived. And so um, keeping the natural uh, features of curiosity, passion, uh, risk-taking, disrespect for authority, uh, uh, propensity for, for, for novelty and new solutions, these are things that in children are natural and can be maintained in young adults or in adulthood. There is even a word for it. It's called neoteny. And, and so promoting neoteny is extremely fr fruitful in today's uh, society. Awesome. Wow. I've got a two-year-old daughter and uh, I, I'm going to go play. Um, so tell me, what are you preparing for today that you think will happen in the future? What, um, and, and how are you preparing for it? There are many ways that, that I'm, I'm uh, trying to walk the walk uh, organizationally. Uh, I have teams that are decentralized uh, all over the world, uh, from Venezuela to Pakistan, from uh, Malta to San Francisco, from South Africa to Australia, and uh, being able to effortlessly uh, achieve common goals uh, with people who... Um, work together, no geographical boundaries, is for me exhilarating. And I believe that it will be a very important defining feature of not only how we work, but how we also create a new uh, level of political consciousness and awareness of uh, what uh, uh, the 21st uh, century civilization should mean going beyond uh, the happenstance of the place of birth or citizenship or where you end up paying uh, your, your national taxes based on residency or, or, or else. Um, in, in other ways, I am uh, exploring uh, uh, what it means uh, to build a, um, a human machine civilization where we complement each other, uh, but also we uh, redefine what it means to be uh, a human and what it means to be a machine. I have an implant uh, in my left hand that allows me to um, uh, interface with machines directly. Uh, this chip is a, uh, an entire computer the size of a grain of rice uh, embedded in a glass uh, uh, bead. Uh, it has no battery. It receives energy directly from 
the communication with the outside world. It can compute, it can uh, memorize and store information, it can communicate. And the environment that is able to understand and respond to uh, a cyborg uh, is uh, slowly emerging. Uh, a little bit like electricity um, designed a new way that we understood the environment a uh, hundred plus years ago and the electrification of uh, our world is still an ongoing process. Uh, our uh, progressive enhancement and enrichment of the human experience uh, through computers uh, has just started and what it means to merge with them and, and what are the boundaries that society accepts uh, for, for those that are uh, more adventurous in this path uh, is is something that is very exciting to me that I'm uh, uh, playing uh, with uh, every day. And, and so I, we've got a series of a few questions that we ask all our guests at the end of each podcast. And um, if it's okay with you, they, they might be a bit from, from the left field. Um, but the first one I'm intrigued by, and that's what's the most revolutionary thing you've ever done? Well, uh, among those that, uh, that I can confess, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, probably uh, this, this chip is the, the one that elicited the most extreme responses of curiosity and uh, uh, admiration at one end of the spectrum of responses and horror and repulsion on the other end. Uh, of the spectrum of responses, right? So it is probably one of those things that stretches most uh, uh, the uh, the distribution of of uh, of, of human uh, behavior and experiences. Mm. And just um, I like a bit of data. The, the chip. Where can people read more about it or find out more about it? Is there a website or a? Yes, uh, there is a website that you co can go and, and and visit if you want to learn more. It is called dangerousthings.com. Ah, uh, you've just wait. That's my lunchtime taken up now with Google with, with going on that website. Um, <clears throat> and okay, so the next question is: What's the one question that you wish people asked you? Uh, I feel really privileged because uh, people ask me wonderful questions like it happened uh, 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 during this um, conversation as well. Uh, what is the question that I should be asking is actually my personal motto because I believe in the power uh, of our unbounded uh, adventure in trying to understand the universe. It is a never-ending quest uh, that uh, we will bring uh, to unexpected places, not only on Earth, but beyond exploring space and the, and the universe. So um, that question, which you have just asked, I think is one of the most important and the most fruitful, because it really opens up the mind uh, to uh, possibilities. And, and then you can start asking yourself, yeah, that's right. What is the question that I should be asking in my current situation? in my desired outcome, personally or professionally. And it is a very, um, it, it, it is stimulating because it uh, uh, requires you to, to be in a certain place uh, that otherwise, you know, we are all naturally lazy. We may not be going towards. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. So um, a couple more things, but how would you want people to describe you in 50 years time? A lot of us, um, who cherish uh, life and curiosity uh, look at the advances of uh, science and health uh, with the expectation that uh, human life expectancy is going to keep increasing. So if uh, today being 100 years old uh, is um, something pretty unique, uh, maybe in 50 years' time, to be 100 years old, if not common or universal, but at least is going to be less unique. And so, uh, rather than other people describing me in 50 years' time because I will be dead, I'd rather have another conversation uh, with somebody like you and say, okay, so these were the first 100 years. 
Now let's uh, try and understand what the next hundred years are going to be. <laughs> wow, that's the most unique answer I've had to that question. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Most most people assume it's an obituary question. I like it. Um, and the the last thing I'd like to ask you is is what's your message that you'd like to share with the world? We are uh, on a journey for thirteen billion years um the universe evolved and we find ourselves each of us individually waking up and looking out on the world mesmerized by what we see and that kind of wonder is to be cherished it doesn't matter whether it lasts 50 years or 100 or more uh, hopefully not less it, because in the big scheme of things, in the billions of years that preceded it and will follow it, uh, it is really the blink of an eye. So to be able and enjoy that and to um, recognize our common understanding of how precious it is, uh, is, is of fundamental importance. We also have a big responsibility because as of today, we don't know whether we are uh, that part of the universe that has barely started waking up. And if part of our purpose is to promote and to expand this unique state of matter that is conscious, uh, we may be endowed with this, that responsibility. And if that is the case, it is going to be immensely important uh, to safeguard humanity as we evolve and uh, pursue this uh, goal of understanding the world and the universe. We are going to wake up the rest of the solar system, the galaxy, and as we understand more and more, uh, the acceleration that uh, we, we prove should hopefully continue. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Um, David, I just want to recognize you for all of the work that you do in bringing, uh, getting people's eyes open to what the future is going to be, what it can be, and what the opportunities genuinely are there for people. So thank you very much for doing that for the world uh, as a whole. Uh, and thank you very much for your your time today. Um, it's been fascinating. And, and to be honest, I've still got two pages of questions that I'd like to ask. So uh, I, I might ask for a rematch or a round two at some point in time, if that's okay. Thank you very much for having me on your show. And I'm looking forward to questions, not only from you, but also from the listeners. And I will be very happy to be back. Cool. And um, well, just on that note, where's, where's best for people to connect with you if they want to ask you questions or or engage with you, or even hear you speak? I, I am very easy to Google. Uh, so just uh, put my name in your favorite search engine and then connect on your favorite uh, online platform, whether it is LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, or uh, write an email. My email uh, address is david at davidorban.com or any others that you can find. And I read and reply to everything. So uh, anybody that takes the effort of reaching out deserves uh, attention because uh, being passive in a world uh, of so much uh, that we can do and so many opportunities uh, is, is, is not great. So anybody who, who, who wants to be active and prove that uh, by reaching out, I, I, I very much enjoy having a conversation with them. So there you have it, amazing content from the even more amazing David Auburn. If you would like us to have David back on the podcast, please drop me an email via the website, tetrakey.com, um, and let me know in the same email what questions you would like answered so that I can ask him and the rest of the world can find out the answers as well. This episode, as with all episodes, is brought to you by the Tetrakey Business Revolutionary Club our free to join, always free to you, business coaching, business growth, business explosion club, where we teach you how to do business your way, fitting your plan to ensure that you have a future 
that when you get there is one that you've designed as opposed to one that's just given to you by some form of luck. You can join at www.revolutionclub.tetrakey.com or just look in the description below where the web link is there. Go join, engage, and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you.